Welcome to the Knowledge Graph Seminar. Today, we are in the week five of the course. And in the course until now, we've talked about uh, what is a knowledge graph. We have defined the knowledge graph, um, its data model and some query languages. And for the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about how to create a knowledge graph. And in that process, we talked about how to design the schema of a knowledge graph. Uh, last week, we talked about how we can create a knowledge graph from structured data. And the focus for this week is going to be how we can create a knowledge graph from text and images. Uh, today's lecture is going to primarily focus on how we create the knowledge graph from text. Uh, but in the lecture on uh, Thursday, we would also hear about how we can create knowledge graphs from images. For today's lecture, I have structured it into two parts. The first part is going to focus on the methods, which is going to be uh, focusing on the techniques for creating knowledge graphs from text, mostly in abstract. And in the second part of the lecture, I will talk about a very concrete application where we can take those methods and try to apply it to a real world uh, problem so that you can see how the, uh, the techniques work in practice. Okay, so we start with the first part. We will talk about uh, the methods for creating a knowledge graph from text. I will start by giving a little overview of the problem. Then we will uh, talk about a general technique called uh, language models, which can be used uh, both for entity extraction and uh, relation extraction tasks. And then I'll conclude this segment with a uh, summary. Uh, as we all know, a lot of uh, useful information is available in unstructured text. This can include things like uh, SEC filings, Wall Street Journal, journal uh, and financial news. If there is a way for us to automatically process this information and construct a knowledge graph, we can do a lot of interesting analytics on that. And an obvious uh, technique for doing this kind of processing comes from the field of uh, natural language processing and in particular uh, from information extraction. But at the outset, I uh, want to make it clear that today's lecture is not a lecture on NLP and it's not going to be an, any in-depth discussion on NLP. Our, core, our focus and the focus of this course is on knowledge graphs. Like how do we construct structured human understandable representations of a certain part of the world on which we can do inference and on which we can do analytics. And for the purpose of this lecture and for this course, uh, we are assuming that we can use uh, NLP as a black box. It's like a tool that is available to us that we can apply to a given problem towards the goal of uh, uh, creating a knowledge graph. And I cannot stress this point enough because NLP and the techniques that I'm using, they are covered in a full length course somewhere else uh, in the curriculum. And I'm not trying to reproduce or redo that. I'm just trying to leverage what is available to us uh, in the context of uh, the primary goal of this uh, course. In the first lecture, I had shown uh, this slide where uh, uh, we talked about how we can extract information from uh, sentences and represent them in a knowledge graph. So for example, given this sentence, Albert Einstein was a German born theoretical physicist who developed the theory of relativity. Uh, we will extract entities such as Albert Einstein, Germany, theoretical uh, physicists, et cetera. And then we will extract relations such as born in occupation and developed. And we can connect them using uh, this uh, directed graph representation. And once we have the directed graph representation, we can do initial additional inferences using that information, such as theory of relativity is a branch of physics and theoretical physicist is a kind of uh, physicist, et cetera. Okay. Now, uh, but in the overall uh, scope of uh, extracting information uh, from text, we have the problem of entity extraction and relation extraction, like I uh, just described. But there's also the problem of uh, entity resolution. 
And by entity resolution, what we mean is that the same entity can be uh, referenced in a text in many different ways. For example, uh, we may have a person, John Smith, and in the text, we may refer to it uh, by he or the company president, or may, there may be other ways to refer to the same real world entity. I'm not going to cover entity resolution in this lecture, uh, partly because I want to limit the scope and partly uh, what I found in my personal experience is that uh, right now the entity extraction and relation extraction tasks are hard enough to do very well on complicated problems that the focus is not yet on entity resolution. We are still trying to do well on these uh, two uh, primitive tasks. And for both of these tasks, uh, the current fashionable or current trend uh, is to uh, use techniques called language models. And uh, so I'll start by describing at a very high level what a language model is and how, and then when I describe the techniques for entity extraction and relation extraction, I will discuss how language models are currently being used uh, in that process. So the overall uh, concept behind a language model is that it's a tool or it's a model that predicts what word should come in the text in a sequence of words. So for example, if you're given uh, a text fragments, uh, uh, students open their dot, dot, dot. The task for a language model is to fill in the dot, dot, dot as to what could be the next word. For example, in this uh, sentence fragment, we could have students open their books or laptops or exams or whatever else. And with each predicted word, it is going to associate a probability of likelihood with which that word might come next. So more formally, uh, a language model can be also viewed as a probability distribution such that given uh, a set of words x1 through xn minus one, we want to predict the next word xn given that we've already seen x1 through xn minus one in our input. Okay, now language models are used all over the place. They have lots of applications. We go and uh, type in a query in the search engine and it gives us likely completions. So underneath it is basically using a language model to perform the task. Similarly, when we are on iPhone and we are typing a message at the bo bottom or just above the keyboard, it is suggesting the likely next words. So it's a pretty straightforward uh, application of the language model that we see on a daily basis. These language models uh, these days are created using uh, deep learning models uh, and recurrent neural networks is a popular approach for creating those language models. Uh, there are uh, several variations of these pre-trained language models that are available. And those variations, they depend based on uh, what data you use for training, whether it's a single direction versus bi-direction model, which particular neural network architecture you're using. Um, and as I have noted previously, uh, I'm assuming for this course that a language model is available to us off the shelf and we can adapt it for the task that we have at our hand, which is the task is to create a knowledge graph, right? Now, it, it may be interesting to actually uh, say a little bit more about the difference between a single direction versus a bi-directional uh, language model. The example that I gave was a sing of a single directional la language model in which we are given a sequence of words and we are predicting the next word. In a bi-directional model, we are given a complete sentence in which one particular word is omitted. And now we have information both to the left and the right of the word and we are predicting the word in the middle. So it's useful to understand this at a, at a very high level in terms of uh, what these models do and what they have been trained to do. A, a popular language model, which has uh, gained a lot of attention in the last few years is uh, known as BERT. Uh, this was originally uh, developed at Google and more recently there has been a lot of press and news about a new language model called uh, uh, GPT-3. Okay, now, Let's now uh, 
put our heads down and we focus on the um, uh, specific problem of entity extraction. Uh, I will start by giving a running example for this problem. And then I will uh, outline various approaches for doing entity extraction and then discuss the challenges that arise in uh, using automated entity extraction. So take this sentence, uh, uh, Cecilia Love, uh, 52, a retired police investigator who lives in Massachusetts, said she paid around $370 uh, a ticket with tax for nonstop United Airlines flight to Sacramento uh, from Boston for her niece's high school graduation in June, 2020, okay? So we're given this sentence, and from this sentence, we want to uh, extract named entities, which are uh, defined as things like places, companies, and people. Uh, and the definition of entities here is generally broadened to include uh, things like uh, dates, times, and uh, numerical expressions. So for example, here, uh, $370, it's a, it's a number that would be considered uh, uh, an entity. June 2020 would also be considered an uh, entity, it's a, it's a time. So uh, given uh, the sentence above, we, the task is to produce uh, an annotated version of the sentence of the type shown here. So here, Cecilia Love, we have labeled by person. Uh, New Jersey, we have labeled as location. Uh, $370, we've labeled as uh, money. United Airlines, we've labeled as organization uh, and, and so on, okay? So the task is to go from uh, this input sentence shown as above to the labeled version, which is shown uh, below. And uh, typically uh, we use, we, we define a set of tags to uh, mark the entities in a sentence uh, because entities can be more than one word. Uh, there are these uh, five tags which are defined to uh, mark the boundaries, uh, where B denotes the first word in the entity, E denotes the last word in the entity, E I denotes the internal word in the entity, O is a word uh, not in the entity, and S is the single word uh, uh, entity. So given the sentence uh, that we were looking at uh, previously, we uh, for Cecilia Love, Cecilia would be marked by B and Love would be marked by E. And the rest of the words, we can see that they would be tagged in an identical manner. Now, in terms of uh, uh, broad approaches, there are three broad approaches for uh, extracting entities. Uh, there is uh, sequence labeling, uh, the neural models. By neural models, I actually just mean uh, language models and uh, the rule-based approaches. And I'll give a quick overview of uh, each of these uh, approaches. In the sequence labeling approach, we take a standard uh, machine learning type uh, algorithm such as a conditional random field, and we uh, give it training data, which uses features such as a part of speech. Uh, uh, so for example, uh, we may give it an input sentence and we might identify part of speech for every input sentence and say that, okay, if it is a noun, then it must be a named entity. Uh, the training could also be based on um, whether a particular phrase is present in a master list of named entities. Word embeddings, which we discussed in the first lecture, could also be used as a uh, uh, training uh, feature the prefix of a word and whether something is in a, uh, appears in a uh, all caps uh, notation. So as you can tell, uh, if you're going to use any kind of machine learning approach, uh, in this case, a significant feature engineering is required because it's not clear which features uh, we should put in, but there is a lot of uh, wisdom and a lot of practice available uh, using which we can uh, choose what features we should be using in an entity extractor. Now, in the, uh, let, let's now talk about the use of uh, neural models for entity extraction. So here we are going to take an off the shelf language model such as BERT, and we are going to apply it to our uh, problem at hand. 
And there are two kinds of steps that are involved in doing that. First is uh, task independent uh, training. And the second is the task dependent training. So these uh, language models that we are going to get from uh, off the shelf, they are trained on very broad corpus. So maybe all the news or, or some very general purpose corpus such as Wikipedia. But in general, we are always interested in a particular domain or solving a particular uh, problem. So if we are interested in extracting entities from financial documents or legal documents, the step of task independent training is to retrain the model that we have on the domain that we are interested in, okay? So that it understands the peculiarities or the vocabulary or the words that appear in that particular domain. So that's the first step. And the second step is the task dependent training. So in this case, the task is entity extraction. So the next thing we are gonna to have to do is to train our model on, um, on the task of entity extraction. And the way this is done is um, we will take our sentence and in our sentence, we will introduce the special markers. So the sentence we were previously working with here, we have a marker called CLS, which denotes the beginning of the entity and SCP, which denotes the ending of the entity. These labels are pretty arbitrary. We could have put any marker here, uh, but CLS here is, I think, short form for classification and SCP is the uh, short form for separator. Now, when we train a language model in which the sentences have these markers, uh, what it will learn is how to predict these markers, okay? Uh, we can repurpose the language model to this entity extraction task by now asking it to predict whether the next token is going to be CLS or whether the next token is going to be SCP, right? And if we get it to predict these distinguished tokens, we know where the entity boundaries are and we can use that information to mark where the entities are in, in our sentence. So it's a pretty clever way of just taking a very general purpose language model technology and repurposing it to uh, entity extraction task. Okay, let's now talk about uh, uh, rule-based uh, entity extraction. Uh, the basic idea here is that we are going to write a set of rules which will uh, tell us how we should uh, extract the uh, entities. And these rules can be uh, based on either uh, something very simple as regular expressions, or it could be uh, looking up things in a dictionary, or it could be invoking uh, custom extractors, okay? But the bottom line is, again, just like in feature engineering, we had to come up with features here, we have to do rule engineering. We have to, um, uh, have enough understanding of our domain to figure out what the entities are and we have to be able to specify the relevant uh, rules which will help the help extract the entities. Okay, so that was sort of my quick overview of uh, uh, the methods uh, one can use. The difficulties that arise uh, in doing entity extraction well are one obviously is uh, ambiguity. We can have uh, entities such as Louis Vuitton, which can either refer to a company or to a person or to a product. So in cases like this, it's difficult to figure out what should be the appropriate uh, label for that entity. Uh, training data or feature engineering, you know, I mean, or rule engineering, all of that is uh, the bottleneck in doing this process well. Uh, there are, domains where there are variations which are very peculiar to that domain. So for example, if we are doing extraction in, um, in biology, you, you may have entities such as duplication of cell by efficient, I mean, which is like a long phrase, which is very different from the kind of things we were seeing in the example where we were primarily limited to uh, uh, company and organization and location, et cetera. And in some domains, you have to uh, extract very general uh, terms as entities like attach or bind or synthesis. And 
there again, it becomes uh, a challenge how you define your rules and training to do extraction for those very general entities. And finally, uh, entities have multiple forms. Um, so these forms may include uh, singular versus plural. Uh, you may have uh, abbreviations for an entity. You may have morphological variations of an entity. All of those things are going to appear in the text and we won't be able to figure out that they are all referring to the same entity unless we have a lot of lexical knowledge. And if you really wanted very high performance on the entity extractor, we also need a very good lexicon for the domain uh, so that we can accurately distinguish whether different variations of a entity are actually referring to the same thing. All right, so that was my quick overview of uh, uh, term extraction. And now I'm going to uh, move on to methods for uh, relation extraction. And here again, I'm going to begin by giving a few, um, be giving one example of uh, the extraction task we want to perform. Uh, then I'll give a broad picture for various techniques for doing relation extraction, and then talk about what's hard, what is difficult about doing relation extraction. So the example is the same sentence that we considered for entity extraction. And now we want to uh, extract uh, information such as uh, Cecilia Love lives in Massachusetts, that lives in is the relationship. United Airline flies from Boston, United Airline flies to Boston. So those, we want to extract those relations uh, from this sentence. Uh, okay, so, uh, uh, Actually, I have multiple examples, not just one example. Uh, one very popular task that uh, people, a lot of people focus on is to extract information from Wikipedia because it's very useful for um, uh, enhancing the search results. A lot of the fact extraction from Wikipedia is straightforward, but there are a lot of corner cases. So if you look at the Wikipedia page for, um, uh, for Larry King, he has been married multiple times, six or seven times. And for each of his marriages, there is time duration, right? And if a person is married only a single time, then it's pretty straightforward to um, um, extract the spouse relationship. But now the person is uh, married multiple times and there is time and sometimes uh, he was married to the same person twice, right? So it becomes very, complicated very soon to associate appropriate temporal uh, information with the fact that you are extracting. I mentioned uh, domain specific extraction uh, in the, when I was talking about entities, but the same thing arises for relations also. Uh, there are uh, uh, domain uh, specific extraction systems, for example, for the medical domain, where they are primarily interested in information such as uh, um, what things cause what disease, uh, what drug can treat what symptoms, uh, what kind of enzyme or chemical disrupts what kind of process. Uh, and that's those meanings and the, and the way they are defined is very specific and peculiar to the biology domain. And that by itself becomes a whole subfield within relation extraction. Even for relation extraction, there are three broad approaches. Uh, there is a, a rule-based approach, uh, there is a supervised learning approach, and then there is open information extraction. Uh, even within supervised learning, uh, people uh, make a lot of sub-distinctions, uh, whether it is semi-supervised or fully supervised. Or, but as long as the approach is supervised for the purpose of my discussion, I have kept everything under the same, uh, same heading of supervised uh, approaches. The open information extraction approach is a way of ext extracting information they, where they don't give any specific attention to the meaning of the labels. They just extract triples out of uh, text. So, so just as an example, uh, if you're given a sentence, Dante passed away in Ravana, the open information extraction approach will simply take this text fragment and they will 
turn this into a triple, which is shown here to the left. Dante passed away in Ravenna. As opposed to taking this uh, text and populating a knowledge graph in which we have a vocabulary of relations which have well-defined semantics. So on the right, I'm showing a little property graph where we have a person node and there's a city node and there is a relation uh, called death place, which probably has uh, some domain and range constraints defined for it. It has some uh, uh, rules and constraints uh, on what values it can or cannot take. And whenever we uh, are going to talk about where a person died, we would use the same relation, okay? So there is that careful uh, knowledge engineering and knowledge representation that has happened, which would be not done in the case of in open information extraction. In open information extraction, you just process text in a completely unsupervised way. It's a popular and a very compelling story for certain kinds of uh, uh, problems, but it becomes very difficult to do the inference and analytics uh, using the information we will extract in a open information extraction way. So for the purpose of uh, my, lec my lecture here, I have decided to keep that outside the scope because we are primarily focused on knowledge graphs and we are uh, interested in techniques which will help us uh, populate a knowledge graph where we have well-defined meanings for the nodes and labels uh, in our representation. So uh, for the rest of uh, my discussion, I'm going to primarily discuss uh, information extraction or relation extraction based on uh, syntactic patterns and supervised learning. Okay, so syntactic uh, uh, patterns, uh, they were originally introduced by uh, Marty Hurst and in her honor, they are also referred to as Hurst patterns. And I'll illustrate that using um, uh, an example that I took from the original paper on uh, this topic. So let's take this uh, uh, sentence, uh, the bow loot such as Bambara and Dank is plucked and has an individual curved neck for each string. Now, I have never seen a bow loot. <laughs> I don't know what Bambara and Dank is. Uh, these are the words I may be encountering for the first time, um, but we can just from the syntactic structure of the sentence, we can say that, well, you know, Bambara and Dang must be a kind of a bow loot, assuming kind of or superclass is one relationship uh, that um, we are interested in. So this was the key insight uh, that Marty Hurst had. And she said that, well, you know, we can uh, define such syntactic patterns, which based on the way a sentence is structured could give us very strong indication for what might be the uh, relationship between them. And she had in her original uh, paper, she had um, several examples. So for example, if is, we have a sentence such as work by authors, such as Herrick, Goldsmith and blah, blah, blah. We know that Herrick and Goldsmith, they are authors, right? Um, and then if you have a sentence, bruise, bruises, wounds, broken bones or other injuries, then we know that in, the, in this sentence, bruises and wounds must be kind of injuries and so on and so forth. So you can follow the rest of the examples in the same way. Now, when this idea was originally introduced, you know, people thought, oh, wow, this is really cool. And uh, if you can do the extraction like this, wouldn't this be really a very scalable way of doing it? But it turns out it's not that easy to generalize. And so they, even in the original paper, you know, there was this section on, okay, how do you generalize it to relations that you have not seen? And the general methodology that was suggested was that, well, if you want to extract a certain relation, what you do is you collect lots and lots of examples of sentences where that relation is described. And from there, you try to figure out uh, what are the general patterns. And then for those general patterns, you define the syntactic rules. Now, if you take some relationships such as um, uh, has part, it's been very difficult to find very general patterns about how you would extract it from the, uh, from the text. And I will actually give you more examples of this in the second part of my, uh, of my lecture. <clears throat> uh, some people have, <clears throat> uh, 
some people have undertaken research to see if they could <clears throat> Uh, automatically learn these patterns uh, instead of having to uh, manually engineer these uh, patterns using um, uh, using examples and working backwards from example instances of these relations and sentences, can we somehow automatically uh, learn them? And that also has limited success. I mean, there is some success in limited domains, but not in a sort of very general purpose uh, manner. Okay. Now let's switch to uh, the uh, supervised learning approach for, um, for relation extraction. Uh, and first and foremost, you know, it requires a huge amount of training data. Uh, you, know, you may not be uh, required to define patterns for the example occurrence of a relation is in a sentence, but you still have to find those uh, sentences where those relations occur. Uh, and some people, uh, are, what they do is they would use the Mar Marty Hurst style uh, syntactic patterns, and they would use those patterns to generate lots and lots of training data, right? In the in the opposite direction. Given that these training data, uh, these syntactic patterns, they are not very general, and they don't always work. There is this recent idea um, uh, called approximate labeling. And this is something which uh, Chris Ray in, in our department here has uh, pioneered. And the basic idea there is that, well, you know, we can't come up with a clear way to figure out whether a particular relation exists in a sentence or not. So we are going to have lots and lots of different syntactic patterns, which might suggest that this relationship might exist in a sentence. And then we are going to uh, uh, use all of them. And then through a training process, we are going to learn how good each of these is. And we are going to combine, uh, uh, combine the, uh, the input or the signal that they give us into um, what we are going to feed into our, uh, into our learning algorithm. So as a concrete example, let's say we are, we have a relationship has part, we want to learn this from the syntactic structure of the, uh, of the sentence. Now, if our weak, weak labeling function could be that if in a sentence we have A has B or A have B, then we could say that, oh, you know, this might be suggesting that A has part B. And we know this is not correct. This is not always correct. In some cases, this is correct. But that is a labeling function, a weak labeling function that we can use in our training algorithm, which eventually, based on experience, would get better. OK. Uh, next, uh, let's talk about how we can um, uh, adapt a language model for the task of relation extraction. And the basic idea here is not very different from the kind of trick we used for entity extraction. So essentially what we do is we take our input sentences and we put these special markers in our um, uh, sentence, which denote the beginning and end of each term. So term one start and term one end, that denotes the first entity and term to start and term to end uh, denotes the second entity. And in our training data, what we are going to train our language model to do is that when, they, when the language model encounters a sentence like this, its output should be lives in, which is the relationship that we are trying to predict. So again, you know, the, the basic idea it remains the same. Enhance your input data to add markers which correspond to the task you're trying to perform. Throw lots and lots of data at the model and get it to learn the output you're trying to produce. The challenges you can expect in this case are the first and foremost is the training data. Like how do you get lots and lots of examples of the uh, relations of the training data which are required for this uh, any of these techniques to work. And given that all of these techniques are 
approximate. I mean, they are not going to work in all the cases. We still need human verification at the end. If the end goal is to come up with a highly accurate knowledge graph, you have to have a human in the loop. And uh, I primarily here talked about uh, uh, relation extraction for uh, entities, but there are specialized methods when you are trying to extract relationships for events or when you're trying to extract uh, temporal information about uh, entities. I've not covered them in this lecture, but I just wanted people to be aware that, you know, there is more to it than what I've just covered here. Okay, so that sort of brings me to the summary of the first part or the methods part uh, uh, of what I was going to say. And that is uh, entity extraction and relation extraction are uh, fundamental problems if we want to create knowledge graphs from text. And the overall landscape of methods is that uh, people still prefer to use uh, learning-based approaches for doing so, but uh, the rule-based approaches uh, and syntactic patterns, they are very powerful paradigms. Uh, and people are leveraging them to create or bootstrap the training data that they need for their uh, learning algorithm. We are still trying, the state of the art is still such that we are still trying to do well on entity extraction and uh, relation extraction. And entity resolution, I mean, that's an extremely difficult problem. Again, I kept that out of this lecture just to sort of keep the scope. Uh, but eventually, I think once the entity extraction and relation extraction becomes um, well tackled, entity re resolution is going to be increasingly important. Okay, now I would like now to move to the uh, second part of the um, uh, lecture, which is going to focus on a concrete application where I can illustrate how these methods actually worked in a particular project that um, I was involved in. Uh, I'll take a quick scan at the questions just to see whether there is anything I should address now versus addressing at the uh, End of the end of the lecture. Okay. Yeah, I think I'll we'll take these uh, questions at the end of the lecture uh, as we get into the discussion part. Okay. Okay. So uh, in the discussion, I'm going to talk about an application called Intelligent Textbook, uh, where we are trying to create a knowledge graph from textbook, textbooks. And I will um, show how some of the techniques that I talked about, we were able to apply and how well they worked uh, for our project. So I'll start off by discussing uh, what is an intelligent textbook? What kind of knowledge graph do we actually need uh, for an intelligent textbook? And then how do we extract entities? How do we extract relations? And then sort of tell you about what were the experiences, how, how, how much did we succeed and, and what I think is the way forward for using um, automatic ex extraction methods in service of knowledge graph construction. So I like to define an intelligent textbook as a traditional textbook, which is enhanced by a knowledge graph of concepts and relations, which are found in the book. Okay. And once we combine this traditional book with, with a knowledge graph, I'm calling that uh, an intelligent textbook. Now there could be other definitions for an intelligent textbook, but that's sort of how uh, I've defined it for the purpose of this lecture. Now, the First question that arises here is who needs it? <laughs> why, why, why should you even care? And, and what, what problem are we solving in creating an intelligent textbook? So I think an intelligent textbook of the sort we have been thinking about is useful for um, making it easy for students to learn complex new concepts. And an example uh, student for, um, such who has such a problem is a first year student in a college level biology. Um, and if you talk to these students who 
have aspirations to become doctors uh, someday. And they, when they walk into their biology classrooms, we hand them these thick textbooks and, and they have to master those books if they are going to progress with their education. And the sentiment which is shared by uh, these students is that biology is very complex. It has huge amounts of new words and they feel lost. Okay. To help uh, students like this, um, we think an intelligent textbook could be a powerful technology. And we have built a, a concrete prototype of what such a textbook might look like. And I'm going to give you a demonstration of this book so that you can see for yourself concretely uh, what I'm talking about. Okay, so in a, uh, it has five different capabilities that help students. The first is that for any difficult words that appear, such as proteins, polysaccharides, and nucleic acids, student can get a quick definition by simply clicking on it. Second, it helps cross-link content coming from different parts of the book, including diagrams, regardless of which chapter those diagrams might be defined in. Third, it gives a visualization, knowledge graph visualization for every single concept in the book. And the student can interactively explore this visualization to ensure that they've learned what they were studying. Fourth, as the student is reading a book and they highlight a passage, it asks the student questions. And for example, in this case, um, the student uh, kind of remembers that hemoglobins carry oxygen, but they're not sure. So they decide to touch on that question. And by comparing their answer with the answer returned by the book, they have this renewed confidence that they actually understood the material. So it's a great self-testing uh, device. And finally, they can ask questions from the book. For example, here, uh, the student is asking, compare protein with a polysaccharide. And in response to such a question, the book will uh, systematically compare these two concepts and present the results in a nicely organized table, okay? Uh, so using these five new capabilities, which are powered by a knowledge graph, the student is able to uh, more effectively interact and engage with this uh, complicated body of knowledge. Okay, so that was the demonstration just to make it concrete for you how the knowledge graph is actually uh, being used in the context of a textbook. We, it's, it's actually not just a, a demo, it's actually a working prototype. And we have uh, tested it out in multiple classrooms uh, at some community colleges, at a, at a college campus in uh, Sweden, and also at uh, Harvard University. And we found that these features that I just showed in the demonstration, they are uniformly liked by students. They also uh, lead to uh, better um, uh, learning outcomes and they also it also helps us to underperforming students okay so the real challenge in creating intelligent textbooks like this is to actually build the graph how do we actually build the graph in a scalable manner for lots and lots of books now the next thing one could ask here is okay what what kind of knowledge graph is actually needed okay what is it that we are trying to create, which would enable the kind of demonstration that I just showed. So let's now look at it a little bit more carefully because this example is more different, more different from the um, Cecilia Love example, which I was considering in the first part of the lecture. So let's take this sentence such as, uh, on the outer surface of the plasma membrane, carbohydrate side chains are, are found attached to proteins and lipids. Okay, so that's the sentence. And from this, we want to construct a graph of the sort uh, shown to the right, where we do have things like uh, plasma membrane, um, carbohydrate side chain, those things appear in the graph. But uh, the protein and lipids, instead of appearing as protein and lipids, uh, they appear as glycoproteins and glycolipids, which are more special kinds of uh, proteins. Now, those proteins were not explicitly mentioned in this sentence, right? They were men probably mentioned in some other part of the textbook where they were talking about uh, uh, these uh, more special kind of proteins. But when we extract information and we want to construct this knowledge graph, we want to construct this 
sort of cohesive global knowledge graph. And in this case, to, to, to build something like this, we would also have to dissolve this lipid entity with the glycolipid entity, which already is there in the graph. And similarly, protein entity with a glycoprotein entity. Okay. Now, uh, the, I think the other thing which needs to be pointed out here is, um, what is the actual meaning of this graph? I mean, sure, you know, this is a directed labeled graph of the sort that uh, we've defined in this course, but what exactly is, is this graph saying? Now, if I was reading the logical meaning of this graph, it's kind of saying that for every plasma membrane, there is a glycoprotein, there is a carbohydrate side chain, such that um, uh, that side chain is a part of glycoprotein. Okay, so I'm reading this leftmost part of the path that you are seeing on the screen. Now, the first thing you would notice here is that uh, the nodes that we have in the knowledge graph here are generics, right? They are not things like uh, Sicilia Love or Boston or United Airlines. These are the kind of things that we saw in the first part of the talk. But here we have classes of objects like plasma membranes, glycoproteins, carbohydrates, etc. So the, the actual meaning and what we want to do with this graph, strictly speaking, is much more than what a knowledge graph between real world entities is because there is some quantification and some more background uh, uh, inference which goes with it. Now, we know that getting all that meaning is even more difficult. And, and I think when we were looking at this problem, we said, okay, why don't we see if we can just ignore that all that complicated or background quantifications and those meanings. Why? Let's see if we can even just extract these relations between them. Let's, let's just extract these isolated relations, okay? So that we're still within the sort of uh, narrow version of a knowledge graph and we're not trying to do more difficult or much harder portion of assembling a coherent graph from the book. Let's just see if we can get these um, uh, isolated micro fragments of a knowledge graph. Now, the other part of the problem is uh, the semantic meanings, right? So we are using here relations such as has part and has function. And, and again, you know, they, these are not as cleanly defined as United Airlines is flying from Boston to Sacramento, you know, there the definitions are very clear, but here getting formal definitions, it's, it's a challenge in itself. It's a problem in itself. And it turns out that at least for this project, the biologists we were working with, they're not used to doing formal definitions. They've never even thought about coming up with formal definitions for these concepts. Now, just to sort of make it more concrete for you on the problem and the challenge that, that we faced is, let's see you know, how biologists define has part and has function. They actually like to refer to it as structure and function, right? And if, we, if you talk to biologists, you, know, you get a definition like this. Structure and function are correlated at all, le all levels of biological uh, organization. The form fits function. And they would say that, well, you know, the birds uh, have these uh, wings which are aerodynamically shaped and they help them fly. And that's how sort of we think about structure and function. Or if you, are, uh, uh, if you have bones, bones have honeycomb structure and this honeycomb structure gives the bones strength, but it also uh, keeps them light, right? And so that's sort of what you get. That's sort of what we got when we were talking to biologists about, okay, give us the meaning of structure and function. So this by itself, you know, was not, we didn't think it was very useful from a computational point of view. So we said, okay, well, is there a way we can approach this problem from a computational point of view? And I think the way we like to think about this in, in the context of the design of knowledge graphs is to uh, think in terms of competency questions, right? Can we come up with a set of questions that our knowledge graph should be able to answer. 
And could we work backwards from there to define what should be the meaning of the, uh, of the nodes and edges? And so we came up with two broad categories of questions, uh, diagnostic questions and uh, educationally useful questions. And I'll give you examples of each of these uh, categories of questions. So diagnostic questions are questions which basically test whether the system has the knowledge, the basic knowledge. So if you ask the system a question such as what is the structure of X and what is the function of X, the system must be able to answer it, right? If the system cannot answer that, then uh, you know it doesn't even know what a structure and function is, then um, what else can you expect it to do, right? But you can answer these questions also by string lookup, right? <laughs> So we wanted to go beyond that, right? That uh, we the question should not be simply a string lookup. And in the definition of educationally useful questions, we said, well, you know, the question has to be pedagogically useful and it has to be Google hard. Google hard in the sense, it's not a string lookup. You have to do more calculation, more, more computation to answer this question. And it should not also be too hard, right? Because answering any question about a biology book you know, it's, it's an open-ended research problem, but it should be such that we should be able to solve it in a short amount of time. So we came up with these uh, five categories of uh, educationally useful questions. And in this case, we here means uh, teachers and students uh, from a focus group that we had convened. And uh, they gave us uh, 100, 200 or so questions. And then we sort of sat down and we, categorize them into these five different categories. How do you relate structure to function? How do you perform qualitative comparisons? How do you do similarity reasoning? How do you understand the impact of changing the structure of something on its function? Okay. And we can sort of look at some examples. So for example, uh, if the loop of Henley gets longer, how will its function be back? Okay. So let's say we want to answer that question. All right, so this was sort of a, a set of requirements. So working from this set of requirements, we came up with uh, <clears throat> a vocabulary or, or a set of relation definitions which should be present in our knowledge graph. And we make, made this list. And from this, you can see some of them are purely metonymic in nature where we are modeling the structure of things. There are some relations which are spatial there are some relations which are about uh, properties. And we had a similar set of relationships for functions, but just for to keep the talk scoped, I'm going to primarily focus on uh, the structure relations because that is enough to give you <clears throat> the sense for the complexity of the problem and the challenge that one faces in, in doing uh, relation extraction. So then uh, uh, we spent a lot of time trying to uh, come up with definitions for what these uh, actually mean. And this uh, set of definition, which I also sometimes like to call it like a, a flow chart, may seem a little esoteric, uh, but there is a lot of thought and a lot of literature behind this based on which we came up with. And, uh, and the interesting connection between this sort of piece of ontology research with information extraction is that this is the source for our weak labeling functions, right? And when we do the relation extraction in a, in a few slides, and when we are looking for what should be in our weak labeling functions, this is, your, this is one place where you could get them from. <clears throat> okay, so let me sort of quickly walk you through this, uh, uh, through this logic. We have five relations. Um, um, has part, um, element, material, possesses, and has region, right? And we, we can have any of these five relationships between two entities if it makes sense to say X has Y in English, right? If it doesn't make sense to say X has Y in English, then uh, it, none of these relationships quite likely would apply. Uh, we would say X has region Y if Y is a region of space defined in relation to X. And it does not make sense to associate Y with properties such as mass or density. Okay. And it, it, an everyday example of this would be let's say, 
you have a table and you want to say, uh, define a relationship between tabletop and table, right? And tabletop is a uh, regional space which is defined in relation to a table. And tabletop by itself doesn't have mass or density. Table does have mass and density, but tabletop doesn't. It's just a region of uh, space. Uh, we say X as material Y if Y is tangible and is pervasive in X. Uh, now, continuing with the table example, wood would be material for table because wood is uh, a table is could be made of wood. <coughs> X has element Y if X is a set of entities of the same type or sibling types that Y is an instance of. Uh, now here the uh, more common example would be like if you have uh, a DNA strand where DNA strand is made of a set of nucleotides or you in more common sense world, you have a necklace and you have a set of beads which constitute a necklace. So there the relationship between the necklace and the beads is the element relationship. X possesses Y only if Y is energy bond or gradient. Now you may say, oh, this is sort of very strange way of defining it, but this is actually an example of, example application of what Marty Hurst <laughs> argues, right? So we, we had this possesses relationship and we went into the book and we see where they were using the possesses relationship and we tried to look for a generic pattern that we could specify when X possesses Y and at least for the biology book, this is the best we could come up with. That they were using the word possesses uh, whenever you know, the entities happen to be energy bond of radius. Okay? And if none of these relations applies, then the likely candidate is the has part relationship. Okay? So I think this is the sort of uh, semantic work, semantic definition work, which really distinguishes uh, the knowledge graph relation extraction from open information extraction, where in open information extraction, you don't do this kind of work. You know, you just see what's in the text and that becomes your relation. Okay. And, but here we are trying to pay attention to what these relations mean, how they are actually used and how we might be able to axiomatize them, how we might be able to draw conclusions from them. Okay, so having set up that framework and the problem definition, let's now talk about entity extraction and how we can uh, take entity extraction techniques from the first part of the lecture to solve the problem we have here. So we go back to our sentence and given this sentence, we want to extract plasma membrane, carbohydrate, side chain, proteins, and Okay, that's what we want to get out of this. Uh, then the first question you would obviously ask is, well, you know, where are we going to get the training data from? And our answer was, well, you know, the textbooks have glossaries at the back. You know, the author has already gone through the pain of figuring out what the key entities are and they have made a list. That's our training data. Now, that's actually not a bad idea and not, not a, actually, actually a good idea. The only problem is that uh, the glossaries, they tend to be uh, not very complete. Uh, they don't have everything uh, that you want to extract from these sentences for your knowledge graph. But hey, you know, it's available for free. You don't have to do any work. So why not use it? So that's what we did. So what we did was we uh, found uh, about half a dozen different open source textbooks. We uh, process them and we extracted uh, the, the glossaries and then we, uh, we fed them into uh, a language model. It's BERT, we were using BERT. We first trained BERT we, on these books. We provide, we did a domain uh, task independent training of BERT on these books. And then we fed these uh, glossaries into the language model. And then we, uh, uh, we, we obviously had a dev, test, dev set and the, and the test set, right? In the development set, we had these um, about uh, less than a dozen or so books on different topics, physics, psychology, microbiology, chemistry, et cetera. And then we had a um, um, uh, dev, test, dev set and the, and the test set. And in the, in the test, you know, we were feeding it sentences such as the one you see above here 
all cells have cell membranes, uh, but only some have cell walls. And we were expecting it to give us the sentence of the kind you see at the bottom, where it has to tell us uh, the entities, cells, cell membrane, and cell walls. Okay, because that's going to be the first step that we're going to need to, uh, to build our knowledge graph. Uh, so uh, we tested this out and uh, we found that the precision on this was not bad. I mean, it was 0 0.67, you know, I'm saying not bad uh, because it's, it's not 0 0.2 or 0 0.1, but it's certainly not 0 0.99 of the kind that we would like to have uh, in the book. Um, and the recall was even lower, it was 0 0.51. So I mean, it was missing out on a lot of things you would want to extract. Uh, but the beautiful thing about this was that, okay, this is all automatic. You, know, you can do this, you know, once you have the code, you, know, you, could, you could do this uh, right away. And at this point you would ask, okay, why, why is it not behaving better? And if you wanted to make it better, how would we go about making it better? So one sort of challenge that we saw and we I mentioned in the previous part of the lecture was that there are multiple ways to refer to entities, right? So you could have DNA and then DNA is also same as deoxyribose nuclease, right? And you have to somehow, you either have to have a language model that tells you synonyms, uh, right? Or if you don't have that, and if you just have entity extraction, then entity extractor will think that these are two separate entities, right? And similarly, you know, you may have situations like uh, in a sentence where they are using membrane in another sentence where they're using cell membrane, but they're talking about the same thing. And then you have to be able to disambiguate between the two. In biology, there are also a lot of unusual plurals. So you have things like mitochondrion versus mitochondria. So where mitochondria is the plural form of mitochondrion, but it's a kind of unusual uh, plural. And unless language model knows that, or unless you train your language model for plural detection, it's going to treat these as two separate entities, right? So I think one big lesson that we learned uh, in this whole exercise was that uh, a good lexicon is actually essential if you are going to do very high fidelity uh, term extraction. Um, if you don't have this lexical knowledge or you train your language model to actually learn the lexicon also, unless you do that, the fidelity of information you're going to get through these language models is not going to be very satisfying to the domain experts, okay? Domain experts of the sort who are writing a book, okay? I should sort of make that clear. And, and I think the other thing um, you would have observed by now is that this relation extraction problem is very different from the relation extraction problem I talked about in the first segment, where we had basically uh, people, places, companies, dates. You know, there are four or five classes of entities that we were trying to extract. And here, the, you know, the entities are much more varied. And just even the definition of what counts as an entity is sort of very different from what we tend to see in the, in the conventional relation extraction task. So for example, the biologist would consider a uh, faulty tumor uh, suppressor uh, gene as a as an entity, and then the question is, really, is that an entity? And this kind of entity, it's unlikely to exist in a very general uh, language model. It's it, it's very peculiar to biology. And then uh, something like control of blood flow to skin, which is a very reasonable function that. Uh, you may want to have in your knowledge graph. But this is a phrase which is six words long and, and doing it using language models, it's currently outside you know, the reach of the current language models. And I had briefly mentioned these very general uh, uh, words like attach and synthesis, which you want to identify as, um, as nodes in your knowledge graph, which the current systems, they won't uh, obviously do. All right. So given that, uh, let's now move on to the uh, task of relation extraction. Assuming you know we can do these uh, entities and maybe we can 
do the correction. Let's see if we can extract some of the relations we are interested in through these automatic methods. Now let's go back to the uh, sentence we were working with. Uh, we have the entities as uh, shown at the top. We have uh, relations as shown at the bottom. We, we've identified here that you know plasma membrane has part carbohydrate side chain. And because they are connected, then they must be abutting each other. So we are using a one metonymic and one, one uh, spatial uh, relationship. Uh, now, the first question that obviously arises here is, uh, where do we get the training data from? Now, in this case, uh, we had some training data we could get from the existing knowledge base because we had a knowledge base we had hand built. And there is this distance supervision technique using which you can uh, take, if you already know some relations, you can map them to, uh, to the uh, textbook sentences. And in addition, we use the weak supervision technique um, of Chris Ray style based on the semantic definitions of these relationships that I had uh, um, uh, alluded to earlier. So essentially the way the weak supervision works is we define a set of label functions. We uh, apply each of these label functions to uh, every training instance that we have in our input. And then we aggregate the input that these uh, Labels that labeling functions are giving in, giving us into hard labels and soft labels. Hard labels are obtained based on the majority labels, and soft labels they are labels using calculated by uh, uh, some probabilistic combination of how much we trust each of these uh, labeling functions. And then we have a very similar uh, uh, pipeline where um, we uh, we have the entities from our entity extraction step. We enumerate all pairs of entities, and then we uh, input them into our model. We train that model based on our uh, pre-existing knowledge base and the weak labeling functions. And the task of the model is to tell us what might be the likely relationship between the two entities that appear in a sentence. Okay, so that was that was the process. Uh, Again, the precision turned out to be in the range of uh, 0 0.65 and um, recall was in the range of uh, 0 0.54. I mean, it, it misses out on a lot of things, but a lot of things that it, it finds, they are not too bad. It's not like 10% or 20% accuracy, but it's also not 100% or 99%. Now, at this point, um, the vision that you know a lot of people get very excited is that, well, you know, you want to feed these books into these learning models and, and then get the entities and then feed those entities into a second uh, language model and then you get the relations and then voila, you'll get these knowledge graphs at the other end. You know, people get excited about that, but because the precision and recall is not quite there, this rosy picture doesn't quite pan out in, in practice. I don't think it's going to pan out anytime soon. So the picture that I sort of think how these uh, technologies can be used for, um, for knowledge graph, highly accurate knowledge graph construction is to introduce a human review step. So you do some automatic term extraction, and then you have a human actually look at what the uh, model did, and then you feed that into relation extraction, then you have a human look at it. And then there is this still undefined task of how do you take these triple level information and you sort of synthesize and fuse them or integrate them into a, uh, into a coherent knowledge graph. You could also ask this question, you know, who is going to do the uh, uh, human review? And the vision and the picture that I've been arguing for a while is that, well, you know, this should actually be done by the textbook author. And it should just become part of the process of writing the book that you, as you write the book, you process it through these tools and, and it gives you some useful information which will also help you improve the book. And, and yeah, I mean, again, I think the people are sort of receptive to that idea, but I think the thing that I try to do is to see, well, you know, we need some kind of a 
uh, futuristic glossary editor and a, and a diagram editor. And this glossary editor gives you a way to bootstrap your uh, glossary at the back of the book in a very comprehensive and text-rooted manner. And this diagram editor lets you visualize every single concept in the book. Okay. And, and then the people start saying that, well, you know, author is never going to do this. And well, maybe, maybe there needs to be an author assistant, a new kind of professional who works with the author and who is uh, in charge of uh, doing this kind of processing. Uh, whether somebody is going to <laughs> buy into this kind of vision, you know, that's still open to open to discussion. But but this is sort of how I think uh, these automated uh, extraction technologies can potentially enable the authoring of highly accurate uh, knowledge graphs. So to summarize, uh, what I've tried to argue in this lecture is that um, entity extraction and relation extraction, they are sort of fundamental building blocks for uh, uh, creating knowledge graphs from text. Uh, at least, in sort of my version of the problem, the uh, rule-based methods or methods which start from the semantics of the relation and their potential axiomatic definitions, that's really the place where we start from. And we can use them for uh, generating some training data and we can feed them into automatic methods. And that I think is already popular paradigm, but sort of my own personal take on this is to bring in sort of more semantic definition from the, uh, from the ontology research and knowledge graph side of things, so that what we are actually learning are things that we can do principal inference with. And finally, just to acknowledge um, entity linking and entity resolution, they eventually will play a big role in our ability to create these knowledge graphs. As we're still struggling with doing well on the uh, more primitive tasks of entity extraction and relation, relation extraction, I'm expecting that entity resolution in a few years might become an equally important building block. Uh, eventually we will get there, but with the current state of the art, I don't think we are, we are quite there yet. With that, I like to conclude uh, my lecture here and we still have uh, seven minutes left for any questions. Cool, I'm so sorry I joined late, but I, I can see a few questions here. Okay on the Q&A tab. Okay, go ahead. So um, first question is, could you mention again, the author of approximate labeling function, please? Yeah, Do so- Do you recommend any specific paper to read about the labeling for knowledge graphs using ML? Okay, so the uh, specific author is Chris Ray. And Chris Ray, he gave a lecture in our seminar uh, last year. Uh, so if you see our series from last year, I think it was the second session where he talked about snorkel and his weak labeling approach. So that's the technology we were using for, for this project. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the next question, could we have a link to the code, uh, maybe in GitHub or somewhere to try the labeling process? Yeah, so I think Snorkel uh, has become a commercial product now. Uh, uh, I think they, yeah. So, and I think if you send me email, I can send you a link to the code that we developed, which is in uh, public open source. Uh, so just send me an email, I can, I can provide a reference. Yeah, so I have come across uh, several open source projects in GitHub. Okay. Uh, so search for uh, search for uh, NLP labeling, and there are a couple of projects actually in that. Uh, there's an open source project called Spacey, um, and they have a new tool called Prodigy, uh, which helps you label stuff also. So that also works quite well. So there are quite a few examples. And uh, the last question here that I see is, are you using predicates such as has part, has function, and uh, function from already published ontologies, or are you defining them internal to your system? So I'd say a little bit of both. Uh, so we actually ourselves have a paper on uh, the semantics of structure and function, which we authored with the 
partner partnership with biologists. Uh, but as part of that paper, we relate our definitions to what's in the broader ontology research literature. So we are not that different from what people are talking about in, in, in the literature. There is certainly some adaptation, like you might remember there was one slide in which I explained the flow chart of how you choose between these five relations, right? So that actually is based, it's, a, it's an adaptation of a piece of work that was done by Maria Keat. Uh, she is um, one, one of the researchers in the ontology research community. So we basically took her, her framework and then we adapted it because she was not addressing all the nuances that we were seeing, seeing in the book. So, so I think the short answer is yes, what we're doing is compatible, but I think we've also made some uh, novel contribution to extending what is already known about how to define the semantics of these structure and function relationships. Cool, thank you. And one question just popped up in the last few seconds. So this is a question about KG validation. Should it be done manually or by done, done by experts? Do you know of any systematic and automatic ways for doing that? So I think KG validation, uh, I view this as a research problem. Uh, I don't think it is solved. Uh, I mean, again, I think the uh, doing it in a manual way is a starting point. Uh, but I think the way I think about this problem in the context of the intelligent book that we were building was that once you have the KG, then you ought to be able to pose lots and lots of questions to the KG and you ought to be able to show the answers to an expert uh, and experts should be able to validate those answers. That's sort of how we were doing the process. But I think once you have that framework in, framework in place, there's no reason why you could not put it on a crowdsourcing platform where you have multiple students rating the answer or multiple teachers rating the answers so that the cost of actually doing the validation is not part of your project. You can somehow sort of farm it out to, to, the, uh, to the crowd platform, right? But it's, it's, I don't think it has been worked out and it's open research. Okay, and on a related question, I, uh, related topic, I have a question. In your project, did you use any implicit feedback mechanisms for validation like Google will collect your clicks and then validate a lot of their algorithm. Anything you did on the students, like measured what they clicked on or something like that? Yeah, we, we don't have that. We did not do that yet. So you yes, did not yes. capture, did yeah. you capture the clicks and engagement? We have the, we have the capture of the clicks, but okay. uh, we have not utilized it. Uh, okay. So uh, yeah, I think that's it on the questions here. There was something in the chat, in the chat. Do you use a graph DB? Which graph DB is recommended? Um, while we were using uh, at the time, what you can call it a logic programming system, uh, that's sort of what we have in the guts of the current prototype. And if we were to ever rebuild it, it would be some version of that. Um, in terms of uh, which graph DB you recommend, uh, <laughs> Naren has been planning a lecture uh, towards the end of the series where he will give us a sort of a survey of the tools available and what, what people should consider looking at. So I'll, I think we should defer that question to, to that lecture. Sounds good. I will keep this in mind, this question in mind when I present that. Cool, I think we are done, uh, Vinay. Okay, uh, Mike, do you have anything uh, to add? I don't think so. Uh, unless you want to have a long, long drawn out argument about uh, rule based versus machine learning or intelligent textbooks and what exactly they are. Uh, but I'm just impressed with how much, how cool the, uh, the, the, the tool that you built is. And um, I would like it to see it go farther, but I'm, I'm happy to see that it's gotten as far as it has. All right. Well, that's a great. Great closing statement. Thank you, Mike, for your uh, support and inspiration. And I will conclude and we will uh, continue uh, our series on Thursday. 
On Thursday, we have two fantastic speakers, uh, Aditya Kalyanpur, who uh, worked on the team that had built the Jeopardy system at IBM. Uh, he will be talking about his current work on creating causal graphs for understanding natural language. And uh, we will have a second speaker, Ranjay Krishna, who defended his PhD thesis on Friday. Uh, he will be talking about uh, how he has been using scene graphs for uh, image understanding. So we will see you on Thursday. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.